What makes your project stand out? What differentiates you from someone who's doing the same kind of work? What kind of tools do you use to express your creativity? Film emulation. What a huge topic. It's not just something we can throw on top of our footage and hope for the best, but it's actually something that we should study and look more into, be inspired by, and then build off of so that we can create our own unique look and feel to our projects that really embody the story. This is something that I think can set any filmmaker, colorist, content creator aside from others. I get really excited every time a new project comes around because I get to look at the project and think about how I can build a good look for that project using a certain type of film emulation because I know it's gonna help me achieve a great result. It's not cheating, but it kind of feels like it sometimes because essentially what I'm doing is choosing from a bunch of different tone curves that have already been created, tried, tested. I then get to use that film stock or that tone curve in creating my own unique look. All I'm doing is using the tools available to me to create a solid foundation to get a really good looking image and then building off of that. As a filmmaker, colorist, or content creator, whatever you may be, it's actually really insightful to do a deep dive into what film is, what are the photochemical processes, how it's developed, because what we learn from that can really help us inform our choices creatively later on in the process or before we start filming. So there is going to be a lot of talking and a lot of information in this video. Please stick around to the end of the video because that's where I'm going to be sharing some of the film emulation workflows that I like to use and also share about a tool that gives us access to features that we don't really have available anywhere else and control that we don't have anywhere else and is really changing the industry. So anyway. So the big question is, why do we want to emulate film? The simple answer to that is that analog film just looks really good and gives us a much more organic feeling image than most of the digital sensors do. Film also brought with it noticeable characteristics such as film grain, halation, bloom, and then also something that's maybe not spoken about as much, which is the filmic tone curves. So why don't we just shoot on film? Well, it's incredibly expensive and the workflows are not really achievable for most people, but we don't really want to lose out on all those amazing characteristics and just be left with a super sharp digital feeling image. So how can we attempt to use the convenience of the digital sensor, but still get an image that has that filmic feel? Well, that's where film emulation comes in. So to emulate film properly, we need to do a little bit of research. It's a good idea to have some understanding of how analog film interacts with light, what causes the noticeable characteristics that we see, and what tools do we have available to help us achieve the best looking image that we can in a digital space. With this knowledge, we then inform our emulation decisions so we aren't just shooting in the dark. A great source of information is Dehance's blogs, which are linked down below. So getting into the meat of it, let's talk about the most important aspect, at least in my books, which is having filmic tone curves. You can add grain inhalation to your image all you want, but unless you actually incorporate the tone curve of the film that you're trying to emulate, or at least some kind of filmic tone curve, your image will still feel like it's just missing something. A tone curve, at least in the sense that I'm referring to, is easily understood when you look at it on this graph. All I've done is applied one of the film print technical LUTs that DaVinci gives you for free to a gradient so that we can see its tone curve represented in the waveform. So when I turn it off and then on again, you're able to see what that tone curve looks like represented in the waveform when we bring that film print LUT onto our image. Obviously, it's just on the gradient right now, so we're not really seeing our image being affected but we can see what it's doing in the shadows and in the highlights and it would do the same thing to our image in those luminance zones. Essentially the tone curve is the shaping of the visual character of our image through contrast, curves, etc. But what it gives us is the actual DNA of the look that we're trying to emulate and then what we do is we sort of build the rest of our grade around that. It's almost the foundations of the house and you build the rest of the house on top of it. We want our image to have a filmic tone curve, meaning that our tone curve in our image needs to carry the same kind of characteristics that would be typical for a tone curve that we would see on a film stock. But a filmic tone curve generally looks kind of like this. 
So it's got a toe which is lifted so that we have a little bit more crispier blacks. And then we have the linear section which is generally unchanged. And then we have the shoulder which helps us achieve softer rolling off highlights. So once we have something looking like this, we are pretty much in a really good spot for our film emulation. The real creativity and uniqueness though comes in when we start adjusting the curves of particular color channels. So adjusting the red, green and blue curves so that we can get our desired look. With this understanding, we can then study reference images to maybe try and get an idea of what kind of tone curve they have going on there and then try and replicate that where we can. But looking back at that film print LUT that we put on the gradient, you can actually see the individual channels and how they've been changed. So there in the shadows, you can definitely see that there's more teal than there is red and they've kept that S curve going but they've got more blue and more greens in the shadows and less reds but in the highlights you can see the complete opposite happening there's more reds than there is blues and greens giving the highlights that warm feel so I know this is kind of kind of intuitive but I'm actually not going to talk too much about grain halation and bloom just because they have been spoken about so much in so many other videos but also I want to direct you to D Hans's blog because there really is just so much information there and it's articulated so much better than I could articulate it so it's all in the link down below just do some reading it it really is super interesting what's important to note is that those characteristics are more prevalent in different types of film stocks not all the tools that we have available to us actually give us all that much control so for instance DaVinci Resolve's tools are really great the grain and the halation they do look really really nice but I do feel like they're missing something first of all the grain is just an overlay so there's no actual interaction with the information of your clip but if you think about it analog grain is actually responding to the physical light hitting the film stock so we would kind of want that to happen in our digital process if we can and don't ask me how but Dehancer has achieved that with their algorithm so their grain actually responds to the information of your clip meaning that it feels a lot more organic and almost like true film grain the halation effect also gives you so many options when it comes to just quickly emulating a, a different type of film. You can just switch between 35mm, 16mm, 8mm or whatever you're really wanting but then also choose custom and have all these different controls available to you. And you'd be able to affect things like the global diffusion and the local diffusion and really dial in the look for your halation. And they also do the same with their bloom and the same for their grain. So if you are going to be doing film emulation, for me it just makes sense to use the Dehancer tools just because you have so many more options, it saves you time and it looks better. Halation is a difficult topic to talk about. The reason it's so difficult to talk about is because it is a very technical effect that is caused but what it does do to our footage is give it a very dreamy and nostalgic like feel so especially where we've got these strong highlights popping we're most likely going to see some elation and oftentimes bloom comes along with that so if we are wanting to soften up our image take that digital edge off these are the kind of characteristics that we want to incorporate into our emulation workflows so now that we've got all of that out of the way we can jump into the two workflows that we're going to be talking about so the first workflow we're going to talk about is done completely in DaVinci Resolve. You can get some great results like this and honestly this is the workflow that I use for so many projects. The important thing to make sure is that you're setting up your project correctly when you're using these kind of workflows. And so what I like to do is to use a group workflow and that way I can have access to a group pre-clip, a clip, a group post clip and a timeline level node graph so that I can add effects where I need to. I like to treat the footage as if it is a film negative and so when we would receive a film negative there would be grain already in it, halation is already there because it's interactive with the light and so I kind of like to add those effects into my group pre-clip so it's happening before my grade, before any of my primaries and any of my secondaries so contrast, saturation happening and then I'm monitoring how those effects are playing off of the changes that I make in my clip level node graph. So the first thing that I do is group all my clips together and then in my group post clip I would add a CST or a color space transform and what I'm wanting to do is transform my gamma to Cineon film log. So if we got our footage in a log format we've then done a color space transform and now we have it in a rec 709 but what I really want to do is output my gamma to a Cineon film log and then in a serial node we're going to right click go down to LUT, film looks and you'll see that we have a bunch of options there. 
but realistically we're only looking at the options that state rec 709 because that is our output so now if you look at it we've only got six options that we can really use but in actual fact you've only got two LUTs that you're actually using but just with slight changes to the tone curve or rather to the white point meaning that they are a little bit warmer or cooler so D55 is warmer and D65 is cooler whereas D60 is pretty much the neutral point so now that we've got this really nice tone curve applied to all of our images across our project, it's now the DNA of our project. But if you were to just go look at your footage, it's probably looking all over the place. So I then like to go turn that off, make sure I'm outputting to a Gamma 2.4, so I'm just seeing a Rec 709 image and then balancing all of my shots so that they're looking consistent in all the scenes that they need to be and then reapplying my look because now it's going off of a consistent level and you can actually see everything that you need to see. And now to really start getting our film emulation working, we go into our group pre-clip level node graph and we can apply our grain and our halation. Once you've applied your grain, you'll see that there's quite a few options for us to be able to toggle on and off and to try and to adjust. And then that's pretty much it. You have your DNA for this workflow set up and ready to go. Just make sure that all your images have been balanced so that it fits across nicely. And then all you want to do is just some look adjustments, some contrast, some saturation, and whatever you might want to do to build on top of your foundation. One thing that I do want to talk about is the deep richness that is so loved about Filmic Tones as well. And to do this, what we're going to do is go to a new node, right click, go down to color space, choose HSV which stands for hue, saturation and value. Then we're going to right click on that same node, go down to channels and turn off channels 1 and 3. Meaning that we've turned off hue and value and now we're just left with saturation. And now as we adjust our gamma and our lift, you'll see that we're adding in this really deep, beautiful, dense looking saturation that we wouldn't just achieve with our saturation slider. Using these kind of techniques can really help you sell your film emulation. And like I said, I love this technique and I've used it so many times. But let's move on to the next technique, which is using Dehancer. The crazy thing for me is that it really just makes all of this lightning fast. All I'm doing is adding one node right at the end of my workflow. And then I can go in and I have all of these parameters that I can use. And like I said, I feel like this is the closest that we can actually get in the digital space to processing our footage as if it were in a film lab. The crazy thing here is that instead of me going and replicating a certain type of tone curve by building myself or using a film print lab, and only having six options. What I can do with Dehancer is go through the insane amount of film profiles that they have built off of actual film stocks, meaning that these are pretty much just turn curves and film stocks that you can just choose and they are going to apply that turn curve and you'll be able to emulate that film stock. So recently I've been working on a project where my reference was the movie Moonlight, specifically the section where they're shooting on the Agfa film stock. And because Dehancer have built this film stock already, what I can do is create my look just by using their film stock and then building my grade off of that. So already I'm at a great point in achieving my look and making my client happy, but literally with a couple clicks and I'm there. Everything is so customizable, but they also have so many different options. So not only can I have a film stock which is going to be my DNA or my tone curve I can also then do a film print so I can also use the Kodak 2383 I can use the Fujifilm print light as well but I also have this option here which I tend to like because it just feels more neutral every tool here in Dehancer has been tried and tested by professionals and scientists and people that have spent years building these film profiles so not only do I use Dehancer on pretty much every project now but I also recommend it. I think it's a great tool to have in your toolkit. So if you are wanting to do film emulation, I really recommend Dehancer just because it's going to save you so much time. Not only does it save us time, but it gives us way more options and way more accuracy than we could have on our own. And so there you have it, two different workflows that I use to emulate film and a bunch of information that hopefully gives us a little bit more of a well-rounded perspective when it comes to emulating film. It's super important to have information that helps you be decisive when you're creating these emulation workflows otherwise we are just going to be shooting in the dark and nothing is going to be consistent. The last thing that I want to mention is also that Dehancer has an app for iOS which is absolutely incredible and pretty much allows you to do everything that you can do with the plugin in DaVinci Resolve but 
literally on your phone. You can import footage into it, you can import photos into it, and it really does give you awesome looking results, but right there on your phone. So check out Dehancer down below. There's a discount code if you are wanting to purchase any of their licenses. You'll get a 10% off and I really don't think you'll regret it. I don't think that people should overlook Dehancer as they are achieving things that people have been wanting to achieve in the digital space since digital cameras came out.